Hey y'all, Data Guy here. And today, I wanted to make a video, um, you know, with the new year, new year of trends, a lot of big changes going on in the world. Um, and so I wanted to make a video really discussing where I see the data engineering industry heading in 2025 and really over the next five years. Um, so I wanna spend this video just kind of talking about where I see technological trends going, you know, the debate between cloud native serverless architectures versus some people are actually reverting back to more monolithic self built architectures. Um, talk about kind of evolution and job roles, you know, changes in what roles are actually available, especially, you know, as AI really enables less technical people to play a technical role um, and, you know, make use of maybe their less technical skills, um, making them compete in some cases better than just a purely technical engineer. Um, and then also talk about other areas, you know, where do I see kind of data engineering integration with AI, ML workspace, um, and also, you know, different debates that are kind of going on to determine, hey, where are we actually going to go in the next five years? You know, low code, no code versus engineering first approaches, automation versus more human in the loop systems, and, you know, the age old debate of vendor lock in versus kind of open source systems as well. Um, so going to cover all that in this video and maybe a little bit more. Um, I hope you enjoy it all. Without further ado, let's get into it. So one of the biggest trends right now, and, and I would say kind of debates in data engineering, is the debate between a monolithic, microservice-oriented, and serverless architecture. Um, you know, as you have cloud platforms like AWS, Azure, Google Cloud are the backbone of really every modern data pipeline. Um, and over the past few years, all of them have rolled out their own serverless computing options like Lambda, Cloud Functions, Azure Functions. Um, and these allow you to build and deploy a pipeline that only runs when it needs to run, so you don't have to worry about that infrastructure uh, sitting idly by, which has allowed systems to become you know, really cost efficient and scalable. Um, obviously, it does introduce some vendor lock-in where now you're dependent on those serverless architectures, those cloud services to actually power your business. But this was a really big step up from kind of the microservice architecture that was, you know, the, almost the middle ground between a monolithic and serverless architecture, um, where you had a lot of smaller services that was really complex to manage, but you also really didn't get a lot of the benefits of having non-static, you know, sitting around kind of waiting for things to happen uh, servers. So serverless has really, you know, taken microservices to the point where it's really efficient. Um, especially for larger enterprises where you don't have the expertise to necessarily, you know, go in and build your own big centralized data platform. But some people are realizing that centralized platforms and kind of standardizing on a single service or building our own application in house has been, you know, something where people are seeing a lot of value at really large organizations. Um, AWS, especially, um, and just Amazon in general, has actually started to build a lot more of their applications in house rather than leveraging microservices. Um, and also a lot of orgs and companies, you know, like Snowflake, BigQuery, Databricks are trying to expand their feature set so they can really cover most of the, you know, functionalities you need out of a data engineering product with the aim of being, you know, your one-stop shop. Um, and that you know, obviously simplifies governance and enables a lot more kind of cross-domain in data integration because everyone can join, work in the same system. And then also if you're building it yourself, you have a lot more control over, you know, how it's running, the specifics of how it's running, but obviously requires a lot more expertise. Um, so where I see things going is, you know, I think for really, really large organizations like Amazon, you know, they might move back towards that monolithic architecture because they have that expertise. But I think largely data engineering uh, is moving more towards the serverless uh, architecture where you have, you know, many different services that can be spun up and spun down at will. Uh, because data engineering, when you think about it, is a pretty time sensitive industry. Or, and what I mean by that is like, you typically aren't running all your pipelines all the time. Um, obviously, there are some real-time data stream use cases, but if you're doing things like batch processing, that's happening you know, once or twice a day maybe, maybe every couple hours, um, but there's a lot of downtime between job runs. And so it really just works very well with serverless and architectures because you know, if you only need that infrastructure when it's actually being used and it can be deleted and, or sit idly by when it's not being, you can save a lot of money while still providing the same breadth of service. Uh, you know, monolithic provides really that optimization to, you know, that last 10% of, I really need to squeeze every last drip of it uh, out and I want to use my engineering resources to do so, which is really only relevant at those really massive uh, companies like AWS, uh, like, you know, let's say OpenAI um, and all those kind of services. Now, the next trend I want to talk about, um, this has really just been an ongoing one, but it's an incredibly slow one because it's so difficult 
uh, to actually implement, and that is a data mesh and really decentralized architecture. Um, you know, there's really been a shift towards each team owning their own data, um, where you know they're responsible for you know analytics team is responsible for analytics data, the marketing team is responsible for marketing data, um, and obviously they'll all be sharing data and collaborating. But the data mesh paradigm basically says each of these teams are going to you know, be doing their own data, but we're going to have a cross-platform mesh of services that allow those different teams to connect and share their pipelines and data sets. Um, and it really requires data engineers to think outside of just how do I build bespoke pipelines and power these business units that don't really know what they're doing with their data and to actually building robust and reusable frameworks that teams can then easily use and teams that aren't super technical, that don't have you know, data engineering specific expertise, um, have more autonomy and can actually build and develop their own pipelines with these frameworks that, and standards that the data engineering team defines. Um, so it really requires a lot more collaboration and a lot of planning too um, around designing these so it doesn't become just a mess of you know, people that don't really know what they're doing trying to combine their data together um, and it really depends on a strong central platform team dividing all those rails and making tools that make it easy for teams to actually manage their own data even if they don't have all that technical expertise. Now the next trend I want to talk about is kind of the competition between batch and real-time processing and where I see it going. Um, and where I see it going is kind of more of a format or more of a, I guess, evolution towards micro batch processing. Um, you know, stream processing at the end of the day is just super micro batch processing where you're just processing one piece of data. Um, and a lot of those cases where, uh, you know, you're doing stream processing, if it's not for real time data use cases where, you know, I'm doing, hey, I would need to provide a personal recommendation based on a user search query or fraud detection or operational monitoring, don't really need streaming, especially most data science um, and data engineering use cases. And data engineering is just really expensive to, or not data engineering, but data streaming is really expensive to implement because it requires multiple services up and running constantly processing data. Um, and at the end of the day, micro batch processing can accomplish the same thing, but more asynchronously. And it's also helped that a lot of tools are now moving towards a more kind of just in time based scheduling, where instead of, you know, traditional batch scheduling, which is, hey, you know, run this query at a certain time or have, you know, Airflow, um, you know, trigger a query once, uh, you know, once a day um, to organize my data or pull data and have a pipeline like that. Now, companies are more using tools like Airflow to say, hey, I want to look at this location um, and I want to do thousands of these locations that all power thousands of pipelines um, because now there are dedicated nodes and triggers that can allow you to have those sensor operations to monitor just when data arrives. Um, and so that's really where I see you know, data processing moving more towards is instead of these big batch processing that's run at you know, just regular intervals um, and all the kind of rigidities that introduces, um, micro batch processing really solves that in, in combined with data driven uh, scheduling as well, because now you're just processing that data when it arrives in small enough batches that you know, you're not having a large delta between when data arrives and when it's actually processed in the platform. But you're also not paying for the expense of having, you know, heavyweight data streaming engines constantly up and running and listening to events and then processing those events. Next, I want to talk about where I see the debate between no code, low code versus, you know, more engineering first high code approaches. Um, and I honestly think that the proliferation of, you know, kind of the hybrid tools where there's maybe a less code centric interface, but on the back end, everything is able to be customized and templatized. Um, and then you have, you know, forms that you can build on top of code that data engineers actually develop the business logic for and tools like Python and, and other, you know, languages um, allow you to really have a hybrid approach where some users interact primarily with a low code interface, but you also don't crib those more advanced developers and allow them to customize the low code environments that these users are using with their most more high code you know, approaches, you know, actually getting in there, adjusting business logic, adjusting the platform to work exactly how you need, rather than you know, dealing with one of the biggest problems of you know, trying to adopt low code in bulk is a lot of low code tools lack the deeper customization that you need, especially larger organizations, and you end up building all these crazy workarounds that aren't sustainable. Um, and so having the ability to go in there, rewrite code, add your own code, really customize how an application works, but also do it in a structured way where you're actually, you know, understand the code base 
uh, is really effective at kind of powering both sides of this use case without forcing one side to you know approach it one way or, or the other. Now, the next trend I want to talk about is generative AI and data engineering. Um, and this really comes in a lot of different areas. Um, number one, the uh, area I see it transforming is honestly enabling more non-technical users to actually enter engineering fields. Um, and you know, AI and, and you know, chatbots and you know, generative AI really honestly make coding, um, as long as you understand how to use them and actually how code works, relatively easy to produce. So it kind of has reduced that moat to entry and you know, obviously more increased competition for jobs because you know, now people need to have more complex jobs because lower quality jobs are getting replaced by robotics, AI. Um, and so now you have to kind of be able to use these tools to actually make yourself a better data engineer rather than, you know, just maybe writing all your own code or, or trying to become, hey, you know, I'm the best at writing code because honestly, at the end of the day, like AI is eventually going to be overtaking even the best, most efficient code writers, in my opinion. Um, obviously, it's not there now. There's still a lot of hallucinations, but always like to be forward thinking. Uh, but then outside of like, you know, how it helps you in terms of your business process, because it isn't just a you know, threat to your job, it also can help you if you're already a good coder, become much more effective, help you scale better, write more code, not have to write as much boilerplate code. Um, but then also within data pipelines, um, you know, applying AI to do things like, hey, do automatic uh, log parsing, figure out what the error is here, um, or produce a report based on an update to this data, talk about the change to that data in a more human language. Um, so, you know, you can more easily prepare reports for non-tactical users or users that aren't even used to looking at data. Um, so, you know, a lot of different applications, honestly, throughout the life cycle um, of where you can use AI, and generative AI specifically, um, to both make your job better and then also to do things that really weren't possible before um, in terms of manipulating data in kind of an automated way, but also in a somewhat human way. So the next thing I want to talk about, kind of linked to the last one, is, you know, really the role of the data engineer um, in more ML and AI-centric workloads. Um, those are becoming, pretty much every company has their own ML, AI, uh, you know, kind of approach, and it's, you know, big buzzword in the boardrooms these days. Um, but it also is, you know, something that you're going to be asked to work with, um, provide data for, um, and really where, you know, data engineering is going to become increasingly intersecting with machine learning is building pipelines that now are optimized for feature engineering, that are optimized for model retraining and deployment. Um, and then also, you know, the more expensive, you know, intensive compute demands of real-time ML applications is also going to push the boundaries of existing infrastructure. You need a ton of compute, a ton of horsepower, and tons of data storage to process all these massive reams of data that you need to power modern AI workloads. Um, and so it's going to require a lot of evolution, you know, how people think around big data. Um, you know, it's like 90% of the world's data was like produced in the last two years alone because there's just so much AI driven slop out there um, and copy and paste that's, you know, it's just exploding. Um, and you need to be able to process that and do it efficiently um, to actually be able to make use of it and stay relevant in today's workforce because just only increasing the speed of competition. So last thing I want to talk about is the kind of evolution of the debate of open source software versus proprietary software. Um, and really where I'm seeing this kind of evolve towards is managed to open source projects. Um, you know, obviously I'm a little biased because I work at Astronomer, but we're honestly in the mold of, you know, companies like Databricks and others before that have take an open source projects, you know, like Starburst, build a commercial model out of them. Um, so, you know, they take care of actually running the infrastructure and provide you a team of people that you can go talk to and ask for support about on the open source project. Because that's normally the biggest risk to large enterprises with adopting open source technology is you don't have someone to go to, there's no dedicated person on your team that's gonna know exactly what to do. Um, and, but on the same side, you don't wanna have to hire a bunch of engineers to have to manage it and pay all that talent when, you know, maybe you're just gonna have a couple questions a month. Um, and also, you don't want to go to proprietary software um, because then you're locked in. If you lose that staff that knows how to use it, you're screwed. You either got to hire staff that knows how to use it or retrain them. Typically, a much smaller talent pool that'll work with the proprietary software versus open source. Um, and then also, cloud lock-in. Um, you know, most proprietary softwares are tied to one of the big three clouds. Obviously, there's a billion SaaS applications out there, but I'm really thinking about you know kind of big data applications. Um, and so another reason why I like, well, like that kind of open source but managed model is that it's really easy to take that same code because it's built on that open source rail and move it to another cloud provider. Um, and that way, you know, if your cloud provider gets too expensive for your region or you want to kind of play them against each other, 
you can have that optionality that if you you know we're all in on Azure or Data Factory, it's going to be really hard for you to move out and you know go to AWS and start using step functions instead. Um, so that's also something you know you're going to want to think about as a team. And where I also see a lot of organizations kind of moving towards is having that more open source but on a managed offering so that they don't have to worry about it, but they also get all the benefits um, of open source technology. Um, and that is really all I have for you today. I think these are just the most pertinent, top of mind things that I wanted to talk about and discuss. Um, but I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Data guy out.